moving into a new apartment was supposed to be a fresh start. After a few rough years, I needed a place where I could settle down, focus on my work, and maybe even meet some new people. The neighborhood seemed perfect, quiet, clean, and close to the city, but with a small town vibe. The apartment itself was just right. A cozy one bedroom with big windows that let in plenty of light. It felt like a place where I could finally breathe again. I spent the first few days getting settled, unpacking boxes and arranging furniture. Everything was going smoothly, and for the first time in a long while, I felt at peace. The neighbors seemed friendly, though I hadn't interacted much with them yet. I'd pass them in the hallway or see them in the courtyard, always offering a polite smile or a nod, which they returned. It was the kind of place where people kept to themselves but were still neighborly. But something was off, even from the beginning. At first, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, just a vague sense of unease that would wash over me at odd moments. It was nothing concrete, just the feeling that something wasn't right. It started small, little things that were easy to dismiss. I'd run into a neighbor on the stairs or in the hallway, and they'd smile and say hello, but later, when I tried to recall the encounter, I couldn't remember what they looked like. Their faces seemed to blur in my memory, as if they were out of focus in a photograph. I shrugged it off, blaming it on the stress of the move, the newness of the place. After all, I was bad with faces to begin with. But as the days went on, the feeling of unease grew stronger. One evening, about a week after I'd moved in, I had an unsettling experience that I couldn't shake. I was coming back from a late-night grocery run when I ran into one of my neighbors in the lobby. She was an older woman with gray hair pulled back into a bun, dressed in a simple floral dress. She smiled at me, and we exchanged pleasantries. Late night? She asked. Yeah, I replied, holding up the grocery bag. Needed a few things. She nodded, her smile warm but odd. Something about her smile didn't seem quite right. It was too wide, too perfect as if it were pasted onto her face. Well, good night, she said, and I mumbled a good night in return as I headed towards the elevator. As I rode up to my floor, I tried to picture her face again, but it was a struggle. Her features were already slipping away, melting into an indistinct blur. By the time I reached my apartment, I could barely remember what she looked like at all. That night, I had trouble sleeping. My dreams were filled with shadowy figures, their faces hidden in darkness, watching me, whispering in voices I couldn't understand. I woke up in a cold sweat, my heart pounding, the images from the dream lingering in my mind. The next morning, I decided to shake off the unease. It was just a dream, I told myself. The move had probably thrown me off more than I realized. I needed to get out, take a walk, clear my head. I grabbed my jacket and headed out. As I walked through the courtyard, I saw a few of my neighbors sitting on benches, reading or chatting quietly. I waved to one of them, a man in his thirties with dark hair, and he waved back with that same odd, too wide smile. I kept walking, but the feeling of unease only grew stronger. There was something wrong with the way they moved, the way they looked at me. I glanced over my shoulder and saw that they were still watching me, their faces turned towards me, their eyes blank and expressionless. I hurried out of the courtyard, trying to shake off the fear that was creeping up my spine. Maybe it was just paranoia. I told myself. Maybe I was letting my imagination get the better of me. But as the days went on, the strange encounters continued. I started avoiding my neighbors, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, 
and keeping my head down when I walked through the courtyard. But no matter how much I tried to avoid them, they were always there, watching me with those unsettling smiles. One evening, I was sitting in my apartment, trying to focus on some work, when I caught my reflection in the window. For a moment, I didn't recognize myself. My face looked pale and drawn, my eyes sunken and hollow. I shook my head, trying to clear the fog from my mind. It was just stress, I told myself. I needed to get a grip. But the next time I looked in the mirror, I noticed something that sent a chill down my spine. My features were fading. It was subtle at first, barely noticeable, but there was no mistaking it. The lines of my face seemed softer, less distinct, as if they were being erased bit by bit. I stared at my reflection, my heart pounding. Was I losing my mind? Was this some kind of hallucination? I splashed water on my face, hoping to snap out of it, but when I looked in the mirror again, the fading was still there, even more pronounced than before. The fear that had been gnawing at the edges of my mind now took hold, gripping me with icy fingers. I had to know what was happening. I had to find out the truth about this place, about my neighbors, about myself. I started asking around, trying to get information about the building and its residents, but I hit a wall at every turn. No one seemed to know much about the place, and those who did were evasive, giving me vague answers and avoiding eye contact. It was as if the entire neighborhood was in on some kind of secret, one they weren't willing to share. My anxiety grew with each passing day. My reflection continued to fade, and I became more and more isolated, avoiding everyone, even my friends and family. I couldn't let them see what was happening to me, couldn't explain it without sounding insane. The final straw came one night when I woke up to a sound in my apartment, a soft, shuffling noise like someone was moving around in the darkness. My heart leaped into my throat as I sat up, straining to listen. The sound was coming from the hallway, just outside my bedroom door. I grabbed a flashlight from my nightstand and crept out of bed, my hands trembling. As I approached the door, the noise stopped, and an eerie silence filled the room. I hesitated, my hand hovering over the doorknob, fear rooting me in place. Finally, I mustered the courage to open the door. The hallway was dark, the only light coming from the faint glow of the street lamp outside. I shone the flashlight down the corridor, but there was nothing there. No sign of anyone or anything. But as I turned to go back to bed, I caught sight of something that made my blood run cold. Footprints. Wet footprints led from the front door down the hallway and stopped right outside my bedroom. I followed the trail, my heart racing, and when I reached the front door, I found it slightly ajar. Someone had been inside my apartment and they had left without making a sound. I locked the door, every nerve in my body on high alert. I couldn't stay here. I had to get out, had to leave before whatever was happening to me became irreversible. But as I turned to gather my things, I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the hallway mirror and what I saw nearly brought me to my knees. My face was almost completely gone. My features had smoothed over, leaving only a blank, featureless surface where my eyes, nose, and mouth should have been. I stared at the reflection, horror coursing through me, but the face that stared back was no longer mine. In a panic, I ran out of the apartment, fleeing down the stairs and into the night. I didn't stop until I was far from the building, gasping for breath, my mind reeling. I had to leave, had to get as far away from this place as possible, but where could I go? 
How could I escape something that was happening to me from the inside out? In desperation, I found a hotel on the other side of town and checked in, hoping that distance would break the hold the apartment seemed to have on me. I locked myself in the room and avoided mirrors, too afraid of what I might see. But the next morning, when I looked in the bathroom mirror, the horror was still there. My face was now completely blank, just a smooth, featureless surface staring back at me. I was becoming one of them, one of the faceless ones. I had to stop it. I had to find a way to reverse whatever had been done to me before it was too late. I spent the next few days researching frantically, poring over old records, news articles, and anything I could find about the building and the neighborhood. The deeper I dug, the more disturbing the information became. The neighborhood wasn't cursed, as I'd initially feared. It was something else, something far more terrifying. The apartment complex had been the site of an experiment decades ago, one that had gone horribly wrong. It had been a psychological study, conducted in secret, where residents were unknowingly subjected to extreme isolation and sensory deprivation. The experiment had been shut down after multiple residents were driven mad or simply disappeared. But the effects lingered a residual force that still permeated the walls of the building. Over time, the neighborhood itself became infected with this presence, warping the reality of anyone who lived there too long. The faceless ones were the remnants of those who had succumbed to the experiment, their identities stripped away, their minds hollowed out until they were nothing more than empty shells. They were still alive, in a sense, but without faces, without memories, without selves. They were the perfect subjects, eternally trapped in the aftermath of the experiment. And now, I was becoming one of them. I didn't have much time. The more I thought about it, the more I could feel the presence creeping into my mind, unraveling the threads of who I was, who I had been. My memories were slipping away, and with them, my sense of self. I had to find a way to escape this fate, to reclaim my identity before it was too late. In my research, I found references to a man who had survived the experiment, one of the original residents who had managed to escape before it claimed him. He was now living as a recluse, far from the city, trying to put the horrors of the past behind him. Desperate, I tracked him down, hoping he might have the answers I needed. I found him living in a small, dilapidated cabin on the edge of a forest, far from civilization. He was an old man now, frail and worn, but his eyes were sharp, filled with a haunted knowledge. He listened as I told him my story, nodding slowly as if he had been expecting me. You can't escape it, he said, his voice low and gravelly. Not completely, but you can fight it. You can reclaim yourself. He told me that the only way to resist the effects of the experiment was to reconnect with who I was, my memories, my identity, and my essence. I had to anchor myself in the reality of who I was before the experiment could take it all away. He handed me an old journal his own from the days when he had been a resident in that cursed building. It was filled with notes, memories, and thoughts, his way of holding on to himself during the experiment. He urged me to do the same, to write down everything I could remember about myself, to hold on to those memories as if my life depended on it, because it did. I returned to the hotel and began writing furiously trying to capture every memory, every detail about my life before it all faded away. It was exhausting, mentally and emotionally, but I felt the presence weakening with each word I wrote. The more I focused on my identity, the less power it had over me. But the battle wasn't over. 
The faceless ones knew I was fighting back, and they weren't going to let me go so easily. That night, as I was writing, I heard the shuffling footsteps again, this time inside the hotel room. My heart pounded as I turned to face the mirror, and there they were, standing behind me, their featureless faces reflecting back at me, their blank eyes staring into mine. They reached out with their hands, but this time I was ready. I clutched the journal to my chest, refusing to let them take me. I focused on my memories, on the life I had lived, on the person I was. And then, in a moment of clarity, I spoke my name out loud, my voice firm and resolute. I am Junior. I am not one of you. The faceless ones hesitated, their hands faltering, and in that moment, I felt a surge of strength, of self. I pushed back against their presence, forcing them out of the room, out of my mind. They disappeared, vanishing into the darkness, and I collapsed onto the bed, exhausted but victorious. I knew then that I had won, that I had reclaimed myself from the grip of the experiment. My reflection in the mirror was my own again, my features clear and distinct. I was whole, and I would remain that way as long as I held on to my memories, to my identity. I left the city the next morning, leaving the apartment, the neighborhood, and the faceless ones behind. I would never return, but I would carry the journal with me always, a reminder of who I was and what I had fought to preserve. Because in a world where identity can be stolen, where memories can be erased, holding on to oneself is the greatest victory of all.